Peters. I would ask unanimous consent that the co-chair of the House Task Force on the Year 2000 problem, the Honorable Connie Morella of Maryland, Chairwoman of the House Science Subcommittee on Technology, chair today's meeting. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, I want to welcome all of you. In the past three and a half years, uh, my Science Committee's Technology Subcommittee and the Government Reform Committee's Government Management Information and Technology Subcommittee, chaired by uh, Steve Horn of California, who incidentally couldn't be here this morning, uh, we have been engaged in the review of the year 2000 computer problem with a series of joint hearings and initiatives. Our two subcommittees, which comprise the House Y2K Working Group, have been pushing for greater federal Y2K focus to correct the Millennium Bug. And since we first began our oversight hearings, we've seen vast and significant progress from our federal agencies. In most instances, Y2K was finally mandated as an agency-wide priority. Management leadership was required where previously there was none. And we're very pleased with the results we've seen. We have been comforted by the actions of a great majority of federal agencies, but unfortunately, with only 63 days remaining before the January 1, 2000 deadline, there still remains some concern about certain agencies, especially with regard to their contingency and day one plans. To be fully prepared for Y2K, every organization must ensure that their day one strategies are ready, and that practical contingency plans are in place. Contingency plans provide assurance that a federal agency has covered all predictable possibilities to ensure that its mission-critical operations can continue without disruption. A day one strategy provides a comprehensive set of actions to be executed by a federal agency during the last days of 1999 and the first days of 2000. For those who may have watched the uh, recently concluded World Series on television, you may have seen an advertisement teaser uh, for an upcoming network movie on Y2K. In an effort to hype the movie and to create interest in viewers, in the teaser, an ominous voice boomed, Y2K, what if they're wrong? Despite, it, despite its uh, questionable entertainment value, I think the movie is the one that will actually have it all wrong. One of the most effective methods, however, to survive the movie's hype and to calm any fears that may result is for federal agencies to have effective contingency plans and day one strategies that provide all Americans adequate assurances our federal government will not be adversely attacked and affected by Y2K. Recently, the Office of Management and, um, and Budget, OMB, provided guidance to assist federal agencies in preparing day one plans. These plans are prepared for finite time frames, like the end of December through early January, to help mitigate any problems that may arise. They should address the full scope of agency activity that will be underway during that period. For example, Agencies must prepare to mitigate the impact of possible failures in internal systems, buildings, and, and other infrastructures. Furthermore, the plan should include agency efforts to assess the Y2K impact on its business partners, such as state and local governments, in delivering the federal programs. I'm pleased to welcome representatives of a number of federal agencies to discuss and review the status of their contingency plans and day one strategies. And I look forward to the testimony from the Social Security Administration, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Postal Service. And in our first panel, we will hear from um, the General Accounting Office and the Office of Management and Budget. And it's now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member on the uh, 
Subcommittee on Government Management, Information and Technology, the uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I want to commend you and Chairman Horn, the chairman of my subcommittee, for your diligence in trying to be sure that we are ready in the federal government for uh, January 1st of 2000. We all know that the public faces uh, some risk that critical services provided by both the government and the private sector may be disrupted by the Y2K computer problem. And as every day that uh, we get closer to January 1st, we need to redouble our efforts to be sure that any disruption is uh, reduced to a minimum. Uh, because this is the first time we've ever dealt with such a problem uh, of this nature and magnitude, I'm sure that uh, what we should do is be sure we expect the unexpected. And for that reason, we've asked every federal agency to have in place a business continuity and contingency plan and a day one strategy to reduce the risk of failures occurring in their systems and their programs and services. Without such plans, when unpredicted uh, failures occur, agencies would not be able to have a well-defined uh, response nor have adequate time to remedy whatever problem may arise. So I'm confident that uh, the review of the agency's efforts today will be uh, productive. Uh, and again, I think if the federal government uh, reaches uh, January 1st, 2000 without significant disruptions, uh, a large part of that uh, credit will be due to the work of these two subcommittees that for uh, many months now have diligently worked to be sure that the federal government uh, is prepared and ready. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I look forward to hearing uh, the testimony today. Thank you very much, Mr. Turner, and I appreciate you being here, too. There is recognition that Congress on the House side is not in session today. Therefore, a number of the members of the subcommittees will be reading the testimony and discussing it uh, upon their return. It's now my pleasure to recognize for an opening statement um, Mr. Davis, who is a, uh, the chairman of one of the subcommittees of uh, government reform, the District of Columbia subcommittee, and is a member of the subcommittee on government management, information, and technology. Uh, thank you very much. You know, this is the 23rd hearing of the year on the year 2000 computer problem that this uh, subcommittee has held during the first session of the 106th Congress. Over the last three years, the subcommittees have spent countless hours discussing, discussing mission-critical systems and embedded chips. Federal departments and agencies have spent far more hours attempting to fix these potential problems. Most recently, we have looked at the federal programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, programs that affect millions of the nation's most vulnerable citizens, the elderly, the impoverished, and the sick. But now, with only 63 days remaining until the January 1st deadline, it's time to talk about the contingencies, the what ifs. What if, despite the best efforts, some computers fail? What if they continue working but spew out erroneous data? How prepared are federal departments and agencies to cope with these possible situations? What are their plans? What are their plans for day one, the critical days leading up to midnight January 1st and the days immediately afterwards? I'm, I'm concerned to hear that the Internal Revenue Service has found some unsolved problems uh, with its inventory. Could other federal agencies find similar discrepancies? Uh, because, frankly, uh, the IRS, uh, under their uh, leadership uh, at this point, I think is one of the most progressive in terms of dealing with computers and the like. They have got a, uh, the head of the IRS uh, comes out of that industry. Clearly, uh, we need to have a candid discussion on contingency plans today, and we need to ensure that the federal government and the services it provides will not fail, whether the date is uh, December 31st, 1999, or January 1st, 2000. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And now, um, as we usually do, we will swear in um, our witnesses and on the first panel, Mr. Willemson and um, Mr. Spatilla. Do you, uh, do you testify that the statements that you're about to give are the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will show that, um, that the panelists have sworn uh, to tell the truth. And now, as is again our tradition, uh, we'll give you each about five minutes approximately to give your testimony, knowing full well that your entire testimony will be included verbatim in the record. And so we'll start off now as usual. 
Mr. Willemson, I don't know how many hearings you've been at, sir, but you really have been a stalwart. We feel that you're part of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Willemson. Thank you, Chairwoman Morella, Ranking Member Turner, Congressman Davis. Thank you for inviting GAO to testify today on Y2K business continuity and contingency planning and day one planning. As requested, I'll briefly summarize our statement. We've previously testified on the importance of Y2K business continuity and contingency planning. No one knows exactly for sure what the rollover period will bring. And therefore, such planning is essential to helping ensure continued agency operations in the event that disruptions occur. Over time, we've seen major improvements in the federal agency's efforts in business continuity and contingency planning. For example, in early 1998, we testified that several agencies reported that they planned to develop contingency plans only if they fell behind schedule in completing their Y2K work. By contrast, less than a year later, in January 99, we testified that many agencies had reported that they had either completed or had drafted contingency plans. These improvements continue. For example, we reviewed agencies' most recent submissions to OMB of updated continuity and contingency plans and found that all agencies had identified key business processes as called for in our guidance. A key aspect of business continuity and contingency planning is validating or testing plans. It's one thing to develop a written plan, but quite another to see whether the plan will actually work as envisioned. That's why we've emphasized the need for testing of contingency plans. In reviewing the high-level plans submitted to OMB, we were able to identify 20 agencies that discussed their validation strategies. <laughs> These strategies encompassed a range of activities, including desktop exercises and simulations. In addition to reviewing these high-level plans, we've previously reported on the business continuity and contingency planning of agencies and their components, and we found some uneven progress. We found some agencies have instituted key processes, while other agencies still have a ways to go. Another important element of business continuity and contingency planning that has not yet been adequately addressed is the potential cost of implementing plans. Our guide calls on agencies to assess the costs and benefits of identified alternative contingency strategies. We also testified in June that OMB's assessment of agency plans should consider whether agencies provided estimated costs. And if not, OMB should require that this information be submitted so that it is available on a government-wide basis. However, OMB has not yet required agencies to provide these cost estimates, although we did identify five agencies in their submissions which did so. Regarding day one planning, earlier this month, we did issue a guide to assist agencies in implementing their strategies. And briefly, the objectives of a, of a day one strategy are to, one, position the organization to readily identify year 2000 induced problems take needed corrective actions, and minimize adverse impact on agency operations and key business processes. And secondly, it's very important that the organization be in a position to provide information on their Y2K condition to their top executives, uh, other business partners, and to the public. Our guidance provides a conceptual framework for helping agencies address those objectives. For the day one plans that were due on October 15th, OMB asked agencies to address seven key elements. Elements such as a schedule of activities, contractor availability, and communications with the workforce and communications with the public. Our review of the submissions found that about 40% of the agencies addressed all required elements. Another important part of day one planning is ensuring that the day one strategy can actually be executed. Therefore, day one plans and their key processes and timetables should be reviewed and, if feasible, rehearsed. Our review of day one plans found that 19 agencies discussed rehearsing their strategies, although some did not provide specific dates of the planned or completed rehearsals. 
That completes the summary of my statement, and I'd be pleased to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and we now look forward to hearing from uh, Mr. Spotilla. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Morella and Congressman Turner and Congressman Davis. Uh, let me start by thanking you for your continuing interest in the Y2K problem. As I indicated to you in my testimony on October 6th, your early and continued involvement in this issue has made a dramatic difference in the federal government's preparedness. Before discussing our day one planning efforts, let me update you on the status of our other work. As of October, the agencies report that 99 percent of federal mission critical systems are compliant, an increase from the 98 percent that I reported earlier this month. This reflects notice from five more departments, agriculture, commerce, energy, health and human services, and transportation, that their critical systems are ready. Although a small number of critical systems are still not quite done, in all cases, the agencies involved have assured us that they will complete their work before the end of the year. Moreover, they all have contingency plans in place for these systems. Compared to where we were just last year, this is a huge accomplishment. Even though we expect all of our mission critical systems to be ready by January 1st, it is still important that every agency have a business continuity and contingency plan, or BCCP, in place including a detailed day one plan. These plans describe the steps each agency will take to prepare for the 1st of January. They should address the full scope of agency activity with steps to mitigate the impact of any failures involving internal systems, buildings, or other infrastructure. Agencies must be ready to assess the impact of any Y2K problem on their partners and constituencies and to provide them with appropriate assistance. They must also be ready to provide information about any Y2K problem to their management, partners, and the public. As GAO's day one guidance notes, effective day one planning will position an agency to identify year 2000 induced problems, take corrective action, and minimize adverse impact on agency operations and key business processes. We are working closely with the agencies and GAO to share information about how best to develop effective plans. GAO and OMB have issued coordinated guidance to the agencies. My staff has reviewed agency plans and is working with agencies to improve those plans. We are all learning as we go. The work we are asking agencies to do has never been done before. In an organization as large and diversified as the federal government, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. And given this challenge, the agencies have responded well. Based on our initial review of agency plans, we believe most large agencies are on track. While they need to add more detail to the plans, most do address all of the critical elements of effective day one planning. A few of the larger agencies have had more difficulty. Here we have engaged them at a senior level to ensure that their efforts improve. I have already spoken personally with several agencies to see that their plans are revised to address our concerns. OMB staff are following up these discussions with each agency individually. While a few of the small and independent agencies have done excellent work, a number of them have provided incomplete plans or none at all. To help speed their work, we are meeting with them next week. We will have one or two of the agencies that provided excellent plans describe what the plans should entail. I note that GAO has agreed to participate in that meeting as well. Their work has been invaluable to agency progress in this area. After further work with the agencies, we will ask them to provide us with revised plans next month. From our review of existing day one plans, we are beginning to see some patterns of best practices. The importance of good communications cannot be underestimated. If unforeseen problems arise, agencies must be able to communicate with their workforce, their partners, and the public. Assuring the ability to communicate is so important that a redundant communications capability should be put into place. 
The best plans provide a detailed schedule of activities that will take place during the rollover period. They anticipate the sequence and timing of such activities as shutting down computer systems and bringing them back up, checking their viability and contacting key business partners. The best plans ensure that the right personnel will be available at the right time, whether on duty or on call, and whether on or off site. Such personnel may be contractors or employees and may include building technicians, computer programmers, telecommunications experts, program staff, contracting officers, legal counsel, public affairs staff, and senior management. Finally, we are aware that the Y2K transition is an opportunity for those who might want to disrupt agency activity, whether mischief makers or those with criminal intent. The best plans describe additional steps to guard against such security risks, whether to facilities, personnel, or systems. We are all on a learning curve here. As we identify other best practices, we will share them across agencies. Such cooperation will continue to be essential to our success in preparing for Y2K. We are entering the home stretch of our year 2000 efforts. As in any race, it is time to begin sprinting toward the finish. Day one plans are the critical last piece of our preparations. There will be no let up in our efforts during the remaining 63 days. Thank you for the opportunity to continue to share information with you on the administration's progress, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Botilla. I am um, particularly pleased having both of you here because you have been partners in trying to make sure that the federal agencies, as well as the outreach and end-to-end -end testing, has been taking place. Um, as we start our questioning, I'll start off with Mr. Williamson. In, in your statement, you mentioned several agencies at, at risk uh, of not having solid, well-tested contingency plans, including the IRS that will be testifying today, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Drug Enforcement Agency, Agency for International Development. Um, I'd like to have you tell us what you see the real-life consequences of not having plans ready. To the extent that agencies do not have contingency plans and, and continuity plans ready, and to the extent that those plans haven't been well tested, those agencies run the risk that in the event that disruptions occur, their responses to those disruptions will be more ad hoc and chaotic in nature, whether the, rather than very well planned with a clear roadmap on who's to do what and when and who to report to on what is going on. That is the whole basis of having these plans in place and testing these plans. To the extent that that isn't there, we do run this risk of, a, uh, of an untrained response that is a, a more ad hoc in nature that may not be the right response. And uh, therefore, the response may not address uh, the Y2K problem that may have occurred. So the planning is critically necessary, even though that may not be the end either. I mean, there may be some other implications and consequences resulting from it, but far better than to have what could happen without, uh, without those contingency plans. Um, you mentioned also in your statement the Y2K risk facing state-run programs. This concerns me greatly, like um, Medicaid and unemployment insurance. Um, again, what are the consequences of not having those plans uh, ready? The likely consequences in those kinds of benefit-driven programs that in the event that there are Y2K disruptions and contingency plans aren't at the ready uh, to be implemented is that benefits could be delayed. Uh, benefits could be inaccurate. Uh, and therefore, it's uh, critically important that the contingency plans uh, be pursued, be tested. Uh, I th it's, uh, I'm more optimistic, actually, in this uh, area now because of uh, some of the fine efforts of the lead federal agencies and, and almost all of the states in understanding that this is a critical issue. And they, they are beginning, uh, uh, even those states that were uh, lagging behind are beginning to address this uh, um, very forcefully. So I think there's room for much more optimism, even uh, compared to just a few weeks ago. 
agencies should not be advising the public, should they, of possible consequences in terms of enlightening them? Or I, I think agencies have to be very um, uh, make a very reasoned decision on what they announce to the public and and what they don't. Um, as a, a side note, many of the business continuity and contingency plans in day one strategies are do have some level of classification uh, for official use only. Uh, one of the reasons for that uh, relates to something uh, you had mentioned early on. There's a security risk here uh, to the extent that agencies um, publish too much information about what they plan to do in the event of uh, a Y2K disruption. So that's something that uh, I think agencies have to be uh, make a reasoned decision on, on what's appropriate um, to put out and, and what's not. I think the bottom line is uh, making sure that those plans are in place, that they have been tested, and that all the agencies are poised uh, during the rollover period uh, to address any disruptions that may result. Thank you. Um, Mr. Spotilla, according to OMB, um, and I, I very much appreciate your coming out with the requirement that by October 15th the agencies have their day one plans and contingency plans in effect, but according to um, uh, OMB, day one plans should include specific uh, data such as uh, personnel that should be on call or on duty. Um, and I wonder, what do you believe will be the number of federal employees that will be on call or on duty, as the statement um, uh, designates, on January 1st in the year 2000? I guess what I'm asking you is, how does this compare January 1st, 2000, with a regular day for the federal government? We don't yet have a, um, a specific number of people that we anticipate will be on duty uh, in this effort. Uh, one of the general comments that um, I made in my testimony concerning the day one plans is that we think that a number of the agencies need to supply more detail than they have. And, and to some degree, this is a process where we think we will get more specific information very quickly in the weeks to come. Um, certainly not everyone will be working. Uh, we, we anticipate in each case that core staffs will be available, uh, targeted much more at, uh, at the specific needs of uh, agencies on, a, on an individual basis. So some of those needs relate to uh, verifying that the systems are, com are, are going to work, bringing them down, bringing them back up again. Some of them are response capability, and so some, in some cases there will be people on call who won't, won't, will perhaps not actually physically be on site. Uh, as the rollover occurs. Uh, we will have better information as we get closer to the end of the year in this regard, but we don't quite have it yet. Mm -hmm. but, but obviously there will be a, t a tremendous number of people who will be ready, who will be on call, as you say. Yes, that, that is ready true. To, ready to respond. It would be interesting as you continue on in the remaining couple of months to keep us apprised of that, too. And one final question before I turn to uh, Mr. Turner for his uh, line of questioning is that um, Mr. Williamson mentioned um, something that I think you would agree with, and that is that we don't really have the cost estimates um, of, of what, um, what, uh, what, what implementation is going to cost. Um, and I'm curious about what you're going to do to require it. Yeah, I don't think you've required it at this point, we cost had estimates, and I think they should be uh, something that we should be able to scrutinize. We have had uh, discussions with the agencies on this subject, and our sense has been that the most important focus for the agencies should be right now getting their plans, their detailed plans ready, so that um, we know what it is they're going to do or what they feel they will need to do. And uh, from a cost standpoint, the agencies understand at the moment that they are expected to absorb these costs initially, and they all have resources, we think, to do that. We've made it clear to them that if any feel that, um, that budget considerations are interfering with their plans, they need to let us know and that we will make sure that resources are available. We certainly will come back to the question of cost estimating, but we think we need to do it after the plans are, are ready in more detail so we know what it is that we're actually dealing with. So it's not something we're insensitive to, but it is true that we've not made this a priority equal to getting ready for the event itself. You might consider uh, having at least some estimates submitted to scrutinize.
because my understanding is that it was in August of 1999 when I think it was Department uh, of Health and Human Services estimated that it would cost about $99 million um, to implement a contingency and, um, and day one plan. Well, I think that we will, in fact, ask for estimates. We've gotten some of them in, actually, already. We've encouraged agencies to give, them, give us estimates as they are ready to do so. Um, and I think as we proceed closer to the end of the year, that is something we will be asking of them. Right. Thank you. I'm now um, pleased to recognize Mr. Turner for his line of questioning. Uh, thank you, Ms. Morella. In my opening comments, I made reference to the fact that we probably should all at least uh, put ourselves in a state of mind where we are ready to expect the unexpected. And one of the things that uh, has concerned me even after all of our efforts to prepare for Y2K, to be sure our systems are ready, uh, it still seems to me very possible that um, whether it's through efforts by those who would do harm to our country or simply from those who are on some college campus disseminating information over the Internet, that perhaps we could have on January 1st a lot of misinformation uh, designed uh, with ill intent or simply out of a spirit of uh, being a prankster to try to mislead people and to cause people to take certain actions they might not otherwise take based on the information that is disseminated. And I was wondering, and, and perhaps both of you could address this, I was wondering whether or not we have considered, or perhaps Mr. Koskin and his efforts has considered, creating some type of um, uh, rapid response team that would act as a clearinghouse uh, as we enter the new year to provide a source of, of credibility regarding misinformation or information that may circulate, whether it be over the Internet or from, through some other medium, about the existence or non-existence of Y2K problems. Um, and when I suggest that, it seems to me that that type of panel would need to be people of, uh, of, of some renown who bear credibility, uh, perhaps a three-member panel of people who uh, would be the spokespersons uh, regarding Y2K problems. So that if uh, somebody, you know, we in our office, uh, Madam Chairman, I know you get the same kind of uh, email I do. There's always some kind of rumor circulating on the internet about something the government's about to pass or put a tax on the internet or something like that and we all end up writing these letters back saying that's just a rumor, there's no basis, no, there's no legislation pending on that subject. And it just strikes me that on January 1st there is a possibility uh, that some may uh, try to uh, circulate misinformation uh, that might cause people to take actions that otherwise they would not take. And that if we had a panel in place of credible individuals through which all of that information could clear, and then they could turn to the agencies and turn to the private sector to get uh, the truth, and then be in a position to respond through the media regarding uh, what are the facts, that perhaps we could avoid some problems that might otherwise occur. Have we given any thought to that, or has any of the efforts of Mr. Koskin been directed in that way? Actually, Congressman, we've been giving uh, quite a bit of thought to that, and let me address it in two respects. First of all, from as I mentioned in my testimony, from a security standpoint, um, we're asking each agency in their day one plans to address the question of protecting systems from anyone who would cause mischief, and I think that's an element here. Uh, with respect to misinformation that might be put out, um, here, too, individual agencies will be focused on, on how that information might relate to them individually. In a coordinated way, the Information Coordination Center, John Koskinen's effort, of the President's Council on Year 2000 conversion does have a, a plan for collecting and exchanging information in this area, working closely with their private sector coordinators and else, others uh, throughout the government and uh, state and local government as well to be in a position to verify uh, what information is true and to be able to disseminate it. So the 
coordination center we think will play a key role in terms of overall coordination even though we are also looking at individual agencies to uh, be prepared to address agency specific concerns. Well, I, I would I, urge you to maybe pursue it a little bit further because I think if we could enlist the assistance of some high profile uh, personalities who have credibility, a Walter Cronkite type mm -hmm. who would be a spokesperson along perhaps with one or two others uh, that I don't think it's going to help if uh, there's some rumor or misinformation floating, say, on the Internet, and it's reported uh, that the government denies the report. Uh, unfortunately, we all know the government oftentimes does not have the credibility that we might need. So it would seem to me if we could attach a, a personality uh, to that effort uh, that would have the trustworthy and uh, would be uh, known to be trustworthy by the American public, that perhaps we could avoid some problems that, that otherwise might occur. Well, I think that's a very constructive suggestion, and we'll certainly bring that up with uh, John Koskinen and, and uh, see what can be done in that area. Thank you. I have no other questions. Thank you. What are you going to be doing, Mr. Spotella, on that day? Where are you going to be? Um, I think I will. Uh, I, actually, I've uh, asked my staff to tell me where they think I should be. Uh, <laughs> Never and, leave uh, yourself so wide open. And uh, I've, I've certainly, I'm, I'm certainly making myself available to be right on, right on, on duty here. But uh, we're, we're uh, trying to refine whether that would be. I'm, I'm trying to determine whether that would be positive or negative in the view of the people that are actually going to be, be uh, dealing with our problems. But I appreciated Mr. Turner asking that question because as we go on, I'd like to find out, you know, specifically that how that uh, ICC is going to operate. Yes. And, and I, but I have a question, the same question actually for both of you. Um, I, IRS is going to be a witness on our next panel. And recently, um, IRS reported that the poor quality of its computer inventory poses a high risk to its Y2K effort. I quote that exactly. That was uh, quoted in a letter to uh, Mr. Archer, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and it says the quality of the IRS's inventory currently poses a high risk to the Y2K effort. Therefore, my question uh, to both of you is, in your opinion, what can be done to, um, or what can the IRS do to mitigate that potential Y2K um, problem, those failures, and um, does the IRS have a practical contingency plan in place? They'll have an opportunity to respond, but I want to hear from you before we dismiss this first panel. Well, one, Chairwoman Morella, I think it is of concern to hear a major federal agency still talking about a term inventory uh, at this late date. Um, and so I think there is uh, reason for concern. I know that uh, in testifying related to IRS, uh, I did as far back as February of 97, I know they have a far-flung uh, information system structure, many of their systems out in the field, many of the systems homegrown. Uh, so it is a difficult endeavor to get a handle on all of those. In terms of your quest direct question on what should they do, I think it's just ensuring that their key business processes uh, whether they're tax refunds or tax processing, however they've defined them, that they have thoroughly decomposed those processes f and identified their key systems that they need to be ready in order to do business as usual uh, come the turn of the year. They have time to do that? I think uh, one thing in their favor is given the background of the Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. He's made it very clear this has been a top priority for him for some time. Uh, and he's also made it clear, I think, uh, in hearings I've been at with him that uh, this was a massive undertaking, uh, that it, it, it uh, inc had risks associated with it. Um, and I think uh, there is time to, to focus, again, to, on those most important business processes and decompose them and, and focus on the supporting systems. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, I, I agree completely with uh, Mr. Williamson in, in, in all of those respects. Uh, we're concerned. Uh, we've not had quite as much information out of IRS as we would like to see. Uh, we, we recognize the importance of this, and uh, we certainly are going to do what we can do to help the situation. Well, we'll be interested to also hear from IRS about you know, what they are doing, particularly in light of that um, um, rather 
frightening um, statement. Um, let me ask you about GAO. Um, you recently reported that uh, you, only 40 percent of federal agencies submitted complete contingency plans um, with information on the seven criteria that, that you have established. What are you going to do to make sure that agencies complete these plans? Well, I, in, in terms of their day one strategy and the, re, the required uh, seven elements uh, of OMB, uh, I think I would uh, concur with Mr. Spatilla's comments that uh, OMB is working with these agencies to follow up uh, where there are uh, holes and where ne more information uh, is needed. Uh, I think uh, we also have to keep in mind that uh, uh, many agencies were out front and had a lot of this detail all pulled together. Many did not. Uh, the requirement for day one strategies was initially contained in OMB's September 13th quarterly report summary. So that was the first time a requirement was sent out. Um, OMB's uh, guidance on what to include, I believe, came out on October 13th, and the, then the strategies were due two days later. So I think, I mean, that we're talking about a very compressed time. I think we have to give the agencies uh, that did get a late start some recognition that they have they have time to improve but this has to be a top priority at this point in time i think omb uh, shares that view and uh, in through our reviews and evaluations we have not seen evidence of agencies resisting this entire concept um, what they don't have in many cases are all the details worked out yet and that's what they have to focus on now well i know that I know that uh, GAO was the one who suggested that OMB come up with the criteria, which they did so well, established the October 15th deadline. Now, in light of the question that I asked Mr. Willemson, which is directed to you now, uh, do you have another deadline that you have established where you say you now must get um, the responses, your contingency plans, um, in effect by another deadline? We have done uh, actually uh, proceeding on two levels. One, individually with agencies based on what they have submitted to us or in, in a couple of instances what they've not submitted to us, uh, to work with them to, to get this fixed. We've also, as I mentioned, uh, asked them for, we will be asking them, we've told them informally that we will be asking them for a, a new updated report next month. So there is going to be a new November deadline for them. That has not formally gone out yet, but they've all been advised that it's coming. Um, our priority has been working with GAO and working with the agencies to get these plans uh, in their proper shape. It, it appears as though they may be working very long days uh, in order to do it. And I think you should set an <coughs> early November deadline for that, too. Yeah, we intend to. Um, I, I guess I just have uh, one more question so we can get on to our next panel and know that you have always been available to respond to other questions that we may submit. Um, Another day one strategy requirement is to include data on contractor availability. Do you believe that this requirement is being followed, being overlooked? Because I think it's exceedingly important, and we've discussed it in a number of our other hearings, exceedingly important for interoperability and for the successful operation of, a, of many of the federal mission critical systems. What have your investigations revealed uh, thus far with respect to federal contractors? In taking a look at the strategies that have been submitted uh, thus far, it's a bit of a, a mix. Uh, some of the agencies have ad addressed the issue, know what, where the availability is. Other agencies uh, are still working on this. Uh, I think this is a fairly critical issue. Uh, and it, it's critical from a couple of respects. One is uh, making sure from a government-wide basis that not everyone thinks they have a relationship with the same vendor um, and uh, making sure that that vendor isn't overextended. Uh, and then secondly is laying out in specified detail exactly who to contact uh, with that contractor vendor should disruptions occur. Mr. Patel, would you like to comment? Yes, on once that? again, I would agree. I, I think, in general, 
uh, with most of the agencies, we need more detailed information on this on this subject. This is one of the, one of our observations is that I think a number of the agencies need to do more in this area. Some have done real well. Um, uh, Social Security that you'll be hearing from is we think has done an excellent job. NASA and the Department of Transportation have done very well. But there are a, a number of agencies that we think um, uh, needed to add considerable detail here, and that's one of the areas we're pressing. This is going to be one of the questions we're going to ask uh, for our second to our second uh, panel, uh, what they're doing, and I'm glad that you're both very aware of it and continue to uh, ask for that uh, uh, response. Just finally, the issue of computer security. This is one, as you know, I think is critically important as it relates to Y2K and even beyond that. Um, how certain are you that the remediation efforts of the federal systems have been conducted by firms that are U.S. owned? Um, and then if you'd like to comment on what the risks might be that foreign agents or those with anti-government views uh, uh, might have access to sensitive computer data. If I would I ask both of you if you'd I'll like to comment answer that in that. two ways. One is to give you my non-scientific answer that uh, I think overall we've been, um, if you compare what has happened on remediation uh, to what we thought would happen in the 96 or 97 time frame, we've been a little surprised that more of the remediation work was actually done in-house and by existing contractors as it pertains to federal agencies than we would have uh, thought. Uh, there really wasn't as much um, work that went outside of the existing agency contractor relationships as we would have envisioned. That's point one. Uh, point two, we share your concern about uh, security risks. Um, frankly, we haven't at this point done a lot of work. We do have some ongoing work looking at that uh, right now with some high profile agencies. Uh, um, Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Energy, where we are pursuing that particular issue to see what kind of controls and processes the agencies have in place to address that issue. And thirdly, I think uh, that the executive branch uh, is very, very aware of this particular issue. Um, and it's brought up in almost every meeting I'm in on Y2K over the last couple months. So it is not for neglect of the issue. Um, I, I think there is some level of concern. I would echo uh, those comments. Uh, in general, OMB does not have individual agency information in this regard. We've relied on the agencies and their decision-making process. Uh, we have worked uh, in coordination with uh, the National Security Council, with the, um, the President's uh, advisor on uh, counterterrorism, uh, Mr. Clark, and the Chow office. So we, this is something that we are sensitive to, and we've looked at uh, security concerns here. Um, and uh, we think that um, the right steps are being taken, but it's certainly not something that we are uh, taking for granted. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I think it's critically important we focus on it because it, this whole concept of the potential for computer security could dwarf the problems of Y2K. Um, Mr. Turner, do you have any final no comments? Well, I want to uh, thank uh, panel number one for the work that you've done, not only in, in your presentations and responses today, but continuously that you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll ask the second panel to come forward. Mr. Lorenz. Gentlemen, before you get comfortable, as we did with the first panel, I would ask you kindly to stand, raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Again, our record will demonstrate affirmative response to that. So we're pleased to have on our second panel John Dyer, Principal Deputy of Social Security Administration, 
Dr. Marvin J. Langston, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for C-31 C and the year 2000, Department of Defense, John Gilligan, Chief Information Officer of the Department of Energy, Mr. Paul Cosgrave, who is the Chief Information Officer of the Internal Revenue Service, Mr. Norman E. Lorenz, Senior Vice President, Chief Technology Officer of the United States Postal Service. Gentlemen, I'm glad you're here. It's very important that we hear from you, and I think it was appropriate that you also heard the testimony of GAO and OMB preceding you. And again, following sort of our five-minute five minute rule, we're, we're very flexible about it. We'll start off and uh, let you know that we will hope to have time for questioning and that your entire statement will be in the record, so you can give us a synopsis if you desire. So we'll start off with you then, Mr. Dyer. Thank you for being here. Madam Chairwoman um, and Representative Turner, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Social Security Administration's day one and business continuity and contingency plans for the year 2000 changeover. As a recognized leader in Y2K readiness, we are confident that our monthly payments to 50 million people and the earnings records of 145 million workers will not be affected. However, in the case of the unexpected, we are prepared. To begin with, all of our mission critical systems are certified as year 2000 compliant, along with all of the state disability determination systems, referred to as DDSs. Additionally, joint testing of payment files and direct deposit procedures have been successfully completed, and the Federal Reserve Board testing with financial institutions includes Social Security transactions. Lastly, as far as trading partners, Treasury and the Postal Service are also on board to handle ongoing and incoming exchanges. At this point, I would like to review step-by-step -step our plans for the last days of 1999 and the first days of 2000. For December 30th to January 3rd, designated personnel will inspect, evaluate, and report on virtually every office. Social Security headquarters will stop receiving online transactions from field offices at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 30th, allowing all officials to collect all of our 1990 computer transactions. On December 31st, our computer systems will finish updating SSA's master files. Just before midnight, the Social Security's main data center in Baltimore will switch to jet fuel generators until the power company notifies us that the agency those notifies the agency that everything is fine. Immediately after midnight, December 31st, 1999, teams will begin assessing our system's capability to process transactions for the year 2000. Later that day, staff at selected offices across the country will enter data. We will also test the 800 number. Throughout New Year's Day, a group of programmers will run checks on the computer systems for our 1,400 facilities. Social Security managers will report to their offices, checking all equipment and reporting their findings to regional offices, which will then forward the data to the command center in Baltimore. Approximately 100 sites will serve as barometer offices, including the 55 that do the disability determinations. Agency technical staff will test software systems by conducting a series of typical transactions. The Baltimore Command Center will monitor the processing. If problems are found, teams will be dispatched to make the necessary repairs. Besides assessing Social Security's infrastructure, our Command Center will communicate with several non-SSA sites, such as the Treasury Command Center, to be alerted to any problems that banks may have in posting electronic fund transfers. Moreover, we will advise the White House Information Coordination Center, the media, and the Congress of SSA status. Then on January 3rd, Social Security will open for business as usual. SSA's day one strategy is part of our overall business continuity and contingency plan. The plan prepares the agency to avoid a possible crisis if its automated systems are unable to recognize the year 2000. Within this larger plan, we have local plans for each field office, teleservice center, processing center, hearing office, and the state DDSs. We have developed contingencies for benefit payment delivery building operations, human resources, and communications. For over a year, both Social Security and SSI payments have been made year 2000 compliance systems. Furthermore, we have developed a benefit payment and delivery plan with Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. In November 99, this next month, field office employees will receive training as to the actions and procedures they are to follow should an unanticipated problem occur. 
SSA also has contingency plans to deal with unforeseen emergencies such as inclement weather, natural disasters, accidents, or equipment failure. We want the public to understand that we're prepared for the year 2000 conversion. We want the public to have accurate information. Misinformation and confusion only could generate overwhelming workloads, could cause disruptions. Therefore, we appreciate the Congress and others updating the American public about the actions Social Security and other federal agencies have taken to prepare for the year 2000. For our part, we're committed to informing members of Congress if serious problems develop. If a service to any of our local offices is interrupted and contingency plans are implemented, the manager of the effective office will call the congressional office with specific, specific information on how we'll provide service to the congressional representative, congressional office, and to constituents normally served by that office. In fact, on September 23rd, we sent a letter to the Congress outlining these steps and listing the names and phone numbers of the managers in each local office with your state responsible for calling you. Because of our early planning and testing, Social Security fully expects all our processes will function properly in the new millennium and that we will continue to provide world-class service to the American people. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. I know that Social Security Administration started in 1989 and in preparation. Um, Mr. Langston. Chairman Morello. Dr. Langston. Mr. Turner, thank you very much for your continued interest in this subject. Um, the Department of Defense is very proud of the progress that we have made over the past 15 months in the, of, of this ongoing uh, year 2000 preparation effort. Uh, I'm joined this morning by Rear Admiral Bob Willard, who has been spearheading this effort in our uh, unified forces and, and services, and, and also Mr. Bill Curtis, who has been our full-time person uh, leading and directing the year 2000 event uh, for the past uh, period of time. We have addressed this issue in four major activities. Those activities comprise systems compliance, operational evaluation and testing, contingency planning, leadership preparation, and a transition period which has begun. I will just spend a few minutes outlining the activity in these areas for you. In the systems compliance area, we are tracking and uh, repairing over 7,500 systems. Over 2,000 of those are mission critical systems, the rest are non-mission critical systems. And in addition, we have 600 installations and 350 uh, domains among our main mega center mainframe computers that we have um, work to repair. <coughs> of those systems, uh, we are confident that all of them will be prepared, repaired and ready to go for this event. And currently, we are over 98% complete of our mission critical systems. In the operational evaluation and testing area, this is the largest effort in DOD's history. We have never conducted such a, an integrated and large uh, operational evaluation of our systems. We have done it in two major ways. We have uh, enlisted the uniformed services through the support from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to conduct operational evaluations, which are uh, threaded threaded evaluations of systems of systems uh, operations that support our primary military functions. And we've also conducted functional evaluations of all of the support operations that the uh, foundation, the department, for example, financial systems, logistics systems, and uh, personnel systems. We have also conducted a whole series of service integration tests which are specific to each of our military services and verify that those systems of systems among the services are capable of supporting our needs. In the contingency planning and leadership preparation area, um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staffs has conducted a series of chairman contingency assessments personally led by the chairman and supported by our four-star unified uniform commanders. Uh, they address mobilization, deployment, operations, and sustainment. And these evaluations were two-week-long periods of removing uh, tens of major systems from each of those areas to evaluate the impact of the loss of those systems and the support of the contingency plans that would be put in place should those systems be removed on military operations. In each of those cases, we determined that our contingency plans uh, were an important element of what was needed and that we, in fact, could conduct military operations should we lose those large number of systems. <clears throat> we also conducted business continuity 
uh, planning in terms of both systems continuity plans and operational continuity plans, meaning that we have a continuity plan for every system and we have a continuity plan for every operational functional area that is a combination of systems or a larger function. And therefore, we have a way to support loss of capability in any one of those events. Uh, we've also enlisted the support of all of our uh, uh, inspector generals, both the service inspector generals and the DOD inspector generals and all of our assessment agencies to make sure that we have prepared good contingency plans and that they are in, in sh good shape for these operations. And finally, in preparation for our leadership, we have uh, conducted a series of tabletop exercises which were literally uh, day-long workshops that prepared the senior leaders uh, to explore a, a, the, an enormous amount of unknown what-if types of questions to determine how we would operate the department through any kind of unknown uh, surprise events. Finally, the fourth area is a transition day one operations period, which we did begin in September, uh, the 1st of September, and we will operate through uh, the 1st of March or the end of March of this coming year. Uh, a, part, a major part of this activity has been the preparation of a consequence management plan to help all of our war fighting commanders and base commanders understand how they can respond to uh, situations and external requests from the department uh, for aid and support throughout the United States or uh, other nations in the, in the world. And in that process, we have also established a posture level um, instruction which, uh, which allows across five posture levels each of our commanders to understand what we're, how we are postured and how they're to, to respond specifically to those posture levels. Uh, for example, in this uh, consequence management activity, our first priority, as Dr. Hamry, the Deputy Secretary, has reiterated several times, is to support national command authority or military operations in any form. Our second priority is to support standing operations our third priority is to support civil authorities and public health and safety. And our fourth priority is to support civil authorities uh, in support of economic or national quality of life. Uh, these are all well laid out and detailed plans which we continue to uh, refine wherever we find the need for such. <clears throat> Finally, I would point out that we have uh, had an ongoing operation with uh, foreign nations and our NATO allies uh, with a large amount of effort concentrated on the uh, Russians and their interaction with us for early warning events and for uh, mitigating any nuclear uh, mishaps or, or missteps related to nuclear weapons. Uh, we are currently planning to uh, put in place our Center for Year 2000 Strategic Stability in Colorado Springs. Uh, we have conducted successful negotiations with the Russians for them to participate in this event. Uh, they will be arriving in Colorado Springs on the 22nd of December and working with us through the 15th of January uh, for that particular operation. So in conclusion, I would suggest uh, that we have conducted a very uh, extensive activity over this past year. The activity actually transformed when Secretary Cohen and Dr. Hamry tasked the uniform, commander, uniform commanders and the uh, undersecretaries of the functional support areas to be personally responsible for the operations and mission continuity through this period of time. I believe that it's fair to say that the department literally does contingency planning all the time because of the nature of our business. We do continuously report activities on a 24 by 7 basis uh, throughout the normal year. And the year 2000 event for us is a significant event that we do not take lightly, but it does fit directly into our normal operations. And we feel that we will be ready and prepared to support any national security situation throughout this period. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Langston. Uh, Mr. Gilligan, pleasure to hear from you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman Marella and Congressman Turner. I welcome this opportunity this morning to discuss the Department of Energy's contingency, business continuity, and zero-day plans. As Chief Information Officer for the Department of Energy, I am responsible for the oversight, coordination, and facilitation of the Department's ongoing efforts to address year 2000 issues. The Department has made great progress since the last time we testified before this subcommittee in June of 1998, and I am pleased to be here to discuss our progress with you. 
Achieving 100% year 2000 compliance has been one of Secretary Richardson's top goals for the department. When I joined the department in October of 1998, the department was the recipient of a failing grade on its year 2000 progress from this committee. And turning around the year 2000 program was my highest priority. As you are aware, we were able to rapidly improve our progress to a B grade in early 1999. I am pleased to report to you today that 100% of the department's 420 mission critical systems are year 2000 compliant and have approved contingency plans and that the department is more than 99.8 percent complete in remediating over 200,000 non-mission critical systems, embedded chips, telecommunication systems, data exchanges and workstations. The department has taken a phased approach similar to other large government agencies to its year 2000 preparation activities. Phase one of our program focused on remediating the department's 420 mission critical systems and approximately 200,000 non-mission critical systems. Phase two focused on implementation of additional risk reduction and mitigation measures to help ensure that no department mission is compromised due to year 2000 transition. And development of business continuity and zero day plans to ensure the continuation of the department's core business processes in the event of a year 2000 related of failure. Phase three of our program is now focusing on refining our business continuity and zero day plans that we have developed. This will ensure that we have clear processes to deal with potential year 2000 induced problems and that we have identified individual roles and responsibilities for monitoring, evaluating and responding to year 2000 related events across the department. As I mentioned earlier, phase one of our year 2000 program is nearly 100% complete. During the course of our phase one year 2000 activities, the department has also focused particular attention on the systems that protect the health and safety of our public, our workers, and the environment. As of the 1st of October, all of our more than 540 health and safety related systems are either year 2000 compliant or year 2000 ready, and we will continue to focus close attention on these systems. Furthermore, positive validation of the functionality of all operational health and safety systems will be required within 12 hours of the year 2000 transition to ensure the continued safety of the public, our workers, and the environment. Phase two of our year 2000 program is almost fully complete as well. During phase two, we focused on implementation of additional risk reduction and mitigation measures to help ensure that no departmental mission is compromised due to the year 2000 transition. We have conducted external independent verification and validation of the year 2000 remediation efforts, as well as end-to-end -end testing for all mission critical systems and health and safety related systems with year 2000 date related issues. I am pleased to report that external IVNV and end-to-end -end end to end testing activities are complete for more than 99% of these systems. Phase two of our program also focused on developing business continuity and zero day plans to ensure the continuation of our core business processes in the event that year 2000 failures occur. Due to the complexity and diversity of the department's missions and activities and the recognition that the year 2000 transition poses a unique risk for each site, the department required business continuity plans for each of our 42 sites. Sites have exercised their contingency and continuity plans during phase two of our program. Our first formal readiness exercise was conducted on April 9th and resulted in lessons learned and best practices on contingency planning. On September 8th and 9th, 42 sites participated in our second year 2000 exercise. Sites tested failure scenarios and their planned response to year 2000 related events, rehearsed their zero day procedures, and tested the department's procedures for reporting year 2000 events to our headquarters. Sites reported that the exercise was very helpful in evaluating contingency and business continuity plans and shared with my office a significant number of lessons learned. We also sponsored two department wide workshops on business and continuity planning in May and October to share, share our year 2000 lessons learned and best practices. We are now implementing phase three of our program which involves refining our business continuity and zero day plans. In our review of site business continuity plans, we have found that they have addressed many of the elements contained in the general accounting office's day one planning guidance. 
However, we recently received comments from the Office of Management and Budget that our headquarters business continuity plan had some weaknesses, in particular with respect to lack of prioritization of key processes, inadequate discussion of our cybersecurity efforts, and insufficient detail on our procedures and responsibilities during the rollover period. I have reviewed the plan and concurred with OMB's assessment. Fortunately, with the solid foundation of contingency planning already completed, these weaknesses can be corrected quickly. I have directed actions to revise our headquarters business continuity plan by November 12th and resubmit it to OMB. However, even after November 12th, we will continue to fine tune our plans to reflect final staffing decisions and the results of year 2000 preparation drills within the department and with the President's Information Coordination Center. At the department's headquarters, our zero-day procedures include the coordination of the Department of Energy as well as national and international energy sector year 2000 monitoring and reporting activities. We have developed plans with the electricity, oil, and natural gas industries to re receive reports of year 2000 related events as well as to analyze potential impacts of any disruptions including potential cybersecurity incidents. Our emergency operations center at the Forestall building will operate as the year 2000 command center for the collection, compilation, and analysis and reporting of departmental site and energy sector year 2000 status information to the President's Information Coordination Center. Since March of 1999, I and my staff have visited more than 30 departmental sites to assess their progress toward implementing OMB and departmental guidance to assess the compliance of their status of their systems and to share year 2000 best practices and lessons learned. I can say firsthand that all of the department's employees are focused on year 2000 and continue to work aggressively that we will have a successful and smooth transition. In my opinion, each site is well positioned to manage the risk potential of year 2000 related failures. Final efforts over the next 63 days will ensure that we will effectively handle any year 2000 event regardless of source. Secretary Richardson and I are proud of the department's efforts to ensure that 100 percent of our systems are year 2000 compliant and we are confident in our planning efforts for the year 2000 transition. Our focus and commitment will continue as we complete our preparation efforts. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. Now pleased to recognize uh, Mr. Cosgrave. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Representative Turner. I'm, I'm very happy to be here today to discuss the status of the Internal Revenue Service's Y2K business continuity and contingency plans and day one, or as we refer to it, our end game plans. I'm joined today as well by Bob Albecker, my deputy. Uh, Mr. Albecker, along with myself and, Mr. And, and our commissioner, Mr. Azadi, have all personally made this our number one priority. I'm also joined today by Mr. John Yost, who is our full-time executive managing this program. This is a program that he oversees consisting of approximately 100 people that are directly in his program office, plus he o directly oversees the thousands of people in the Internal Revenue Service who are engaged in Y2K activities on a daily basis. In order to save time today, I'll refer you to a general update, for a general update on the overall status of our program which is in my written testimony, and I'll focus just on contingency planning and day one planning. The IRS is taking every step it can <clears throat> to mi mitigate the risks that are involved with the Y2K challenge. Two ways that the IRS is prepared to address risk are through business continuity and contingency plans, as well as day one plans. With respect to contingency plans, the IRS has developed 40 individual contingency plans that are aligned with the 40 most critical business processes that outline the necessary procedures to follow in the event any of our mission-critical tax processing systems suffers a major failure. We follow the planning format suggested to us last year by the General Accounting Office. We've completed testing all but two of those plans and have addressed GAO suggestions from a recent review of those plans. These contingency plans concentrate on those areas that have the greatest impact on tax processing activities in addition to areas that could be particularly affected by the Y2K problem. Because of the extensive renovation and testing work that we have performed, we do not anticipate a major failure. However, we have developed the necessary contingency plans and are we are ready in the event they are needed. 
These plans address such issues as preserving files and data, how to handle personnel and procedural issues, and delivery of service until our computer systems are restored. I must emphasize, however, that these plans do not provide replacement computer systems for our existing computer systems, and instead they rely on alternative manual processes. Because we have performed extensive end-to-end -end testing, we believe that it is highly unlikely that we will need to invoke such plans. Nevertheless, we have tested them and are prepared to implement them if necessary. As for day one or end game planning, the IRS has devised an end game strategy that will guide our activities during the critical rollover weekend of December 31st, 1999 through January 2, 2000. The end game strategy builds on our current information system problem reporting and resolution processes and identifies specific validation checklists to be used during the rollover weekend. The plan also recognizes a unique problem facing the IRS. This problem is a result of the annual startup of the filing season, which this year occurs simultaneously with the Millennium Rollover Weekend. To ensure maximum risk reduction, therefore, the IRS is taking the following actions. Number one, we are backing up and then quiescing the systems beginning at 10 p.m. on December 29, 1999. This means the systems will be turned on but will not be running business applications. On January 1, 2000, the systems we were brought back up to their normal operating status, this time updated with, with our filing season 2000 programs and validated against quality control checklists prior to the first day of business on January 3, 2000. Second, we are ensuring that sites and systems are operational before the first business day of the new year by conducting a validation check of all systems facility and facilities at over 500 different posts of duty. Third, we are reporting any problems that are encountered throughout the weekend through our existing problem reporting channels. All our organizations will be required to affirm that they have checked critical facilities and systems at their sites to our year 2000 command center, which will serve as the IRS's nerve center during the rollover weekend. Reports will be provided to the commissioner, myself, Mr. Albecker, et cetera, on a uh, regular basis, as well as to the Department of Treasury every four hours during the rollover weekend. Please keep in mind that a successful rollover weekend is just a small part, however, of the meeting the Y2K challenge. Problems for us may arise well into the new year, impacting the filing season. For example, our computers may generate erroneous notices to taxpayers as late as March or April. However, we have procedures in place to resolve any problems that arise, including scanning for large erroneous dollar amounts and dates specifying 1900. Additionally, the command center will continue to operate through April 15, 2000 or longer if necessary, depending on the status of the filing season. We'll rehearse our rollover weekend plan on November 20th, 1999 to prepare participants for this event and to fine-tune our in-game strategy. In conclusion, we're confident the IRS will be capable of fulfilling its mission in the year 2000 and beyond. While we recognize that risks still exist, we believe we're taking the necessary steps to address them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrave. I'm now pleased to recognize Mr. Lorenz of the uh, Postal Service. Good morning, Chairwoman Morell and Representative Turner. Uh, with me this morning are Nick Baranka, who's the Vice President of Operations Planning, and Rick Weirich, who's our Vice President of Information Systems and our Chief Information Officer. I'm pleased to report this morning that we have completed all the technical work on our mission critical systems, including independent verification, testing, and, in, and implementation of a system freeze. We began testing our mail processing equipment in 1998 and extended to other sites last year. In August, at our Merrifield, Northern Virginia site, we started a six-week test of critical mail processing equipment. This equipment ran continuously in a year 2000 calendar mode in live, in live processing equi equipment, testing all equipment types and all mail stream. This facility uh, manages five million pieces of mail a day and we have experienced no problems. We have also created plans to protect against potential disruptions of other systems and processes. We do this every day. In the last two weeks, we've dealt with Hurricane Irene in Florida and the Hector Mine earthquake in Los Angeles. Locally, last year's storm in Montgomery County, we had 48 of 60 Montgomery County delivery units that were without power and we delivered mail. I know at my home in Bethesda, all three days that we were without power, I got normal mail delivery, uh, even though I had to walk outside to read it. Uh, our business continuity plans and contingency plans are building on our experience and formalizing our response to disruptions, both internal and external. 
Our continuity plans deal with the external infrastructure. Our internal uh, contingency component plans deal with the internal infrastructure, all the way from timekeeping to mail processing. Our plan includes working with customers, with other federal agencies, and particularly in delivering benefit payments to the American people. We anticipate that some of the mailers may divert electronic communications to hard copy mail. With that in mind, we're holding the enlarged infrastructure that we have normally for the holiday season, including staff transportation and sorting capability through January. So what is day one going to look like for us? First of all, it's going to be business as usual, but prepared for whatever might occur. Robust day one plans are developed to preempt any kind of problems. Systems are in place to identify, report, track, resolve any Y2K issues. Communications internally with customers, employees, and all stakeholders. We have emergency communication capability. Our, net, our network operations center has been converted into an internal ICC. Our national and field operations center will operate 24 by 7 to assess USPS status and provide resource and decision support. Day one participation will also be in, uh, involved and on site at the President's Council Information Coordination Center and Joint Public Information Center. Uh, in the last meeting of the President's Council on year 2000, uh, the Chairman, uh, Mr. Koskinen, recognized us as the early warning beacon. Uh, we are the only ones that go everywhere every day, and we'll be very happy to perform in that role. Our plans, number one, have been focused on this as a business problem. And we have very, three very simple goals. To protect our customers and by delivering the mail, to protect our employees, their safety and their pay, and to protect our business by collecting the money due and paying those that we owe. We have also implemented a heightened awareness, awareness to security problems. We have engaged reputable contractors with full security background and clearances, and we are uh, providing instructions to the field to protect against any viruses. Our, in a forward-looking mode, we're also working with the President's Council on Cyber Assurance. Protecting our work protects America's mail. We believe the United States Postal Service is ready, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Lorenz. I won't ask you about whether those ponies are ready. Um, but it's interesting as I I scrutinized the, the panel that, that it was planned that we picked uh, those five agencies that I, I don't mean to prioritize as the most important, but have the, the, the greatest influence or effect on our American, um, our American economy and our nation. Social Security, Department of Defense, uh, Department of Energy, Internal Revenue Service, and the Postal Service. And I appreciate your being here. I think I'll try to... Um, ask each of you maybe one question and um, then see if it evolves into others. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Dyer, commend you on having started looking to Y2K and what needed to be done back in 1989. Um, we have uh, recognized um, your leadership in this regard. And yet, what if the computers fail? What specific plans does Social Security Administration have to ensure that its millions of recipients receive their Social Security checks? I mean, you are very close to the people. Yes, we're of course concerned and we're committed to delivering those checks. Um, the, the supplemental security income checks go out before the end of the year. They'll be issued on Thursday, so they're before we turn over. The regular Title II or, or Social Security checks, uh, they go out on Monday is when we issue them. We have worked very closely with the Federal Reserve, the Department of Treasury, and the Postal Service to work out that we can get the direct deposit or the ones, the checks that go through mail there on time. We're positioning the checks and the tapes in advance. We've worked through and tested from beginning to end, so we're very confident that the checks are going to go. If, however, some areas, uh, checks do not uh, reach it, we have fallback plans. If it's with a financial institution with a direct deposit, we would, um, if a bank can, fails to be able to push through the direct deposit, what we would do is find another bank that could do the direct deposit, and if not, we'd work out to get the check, uh, paper check to the individual. If it's um, 
In terms of the paper checks, we're very confident because we worked out contingency plans with the Postal Service. And as you know, in, in hurricanes and other disasters, we've always been able, with the Postal Service, to be right there on site and get the checks to the people. So, so we can tell the, the viewers, listeners, uh, our constituents, do not worry. No. The check is in the mail or you will get the check. You will get your check get or your you check. will get your direct deposit in your bank. Exactly. Well, well, fine. And we will be continuing to watch to make sure that, um, that you continue that way and, and feel confident that you will. With regard to um, Dr. Langston, the Department of Defense, it, it really is, um, you're really the largest federal entity in terms of personnel and a Y2K mission critical systems. I think you have like 37% of all the mission critical systems are within the Department of Defense. Um, consequently, your mission critical contingency plans or your contingency plans for all of your missions have got to be very detailed. I, I wonder how many uh, personnel that you're planning to have ready on December 31st to implement the day one plan. And then do you have any idea of what the cost might be to uh, implement your day one plan? Have you estimated? I thought about both of those questions when you asked them earlier. Um, in terms of our contingency planning personnel operations, as I mentioned earlier, we are, of course, on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week around the world. That operation is actually just being augmented by folks that support the year 2000 system. So in other words, uh, we have compiled detailed lists of um, technical experts or operational experts that support any of the contingency plans, those names, telephone numbers, all the contact points have been established. Uh, we are establishing augmentation cells for the year 2000 to support any of our normal watch stations or command centers, if you will, in major command areas like our unified commanders and like our Pentagon command center. Uh, and for the service command centers as well as the Joint Chiefs. Um, in terms of my, I do not have an actual number for you. My estimate is that we are operating, we will be operating 5 to 10 percent more personnel in a duty, an on-duty status than we normally operate. In terms of how many, how much money we have spent to support contingency planning, uh, we of course uh, continue to report to OMB the expenditures for Y2K. Our most recent report, I believe, specified that we ha we will spend by the time we're through with this uh, transition phase about 3.6 billion dollars on the year 2000. My estimate, although I do not have this broken out exactly in the reports, is that uh, approximately 25 percent of our effort has been towards consequence management, contingency planning, or preparation other than the remediation and testing events that we have uh, conducted. You think, do you think that money, that, that you could find that within your budget? Could we have found have that money? thought about finding that money within the budget that's already been allocated. Well, of, of that $3.6 billion, all of it was uh, DOD money with the exception of the $1.1 billion augmentation budget that we were provided. Um, we have been committed all along to doing whatever we had to do to find the money to support this. This has been Dr. Hamry and Secretary Cohen's number one priority for the department other than national security. So your financial planning has been done satisfactorily up to this point? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm interested uh, in, in how we connect with Russia and what we are doing to help Russia. And I know you've got the command station that you mentioned um, in Colorado in the Denver area. Um, when will that U.S.-Russia uh, strategic command be ready? It's actually ready now. And as I mentioned, we will have Russian people arriving on the 22nd of December and staying in, in an operational January, status through the 15th. Uh, we have been conducting a series of meetings with uh, Russia, in, both in Russia and in the United States. Uh, the most recent meeting was on the 18th through the 21st of October uh, in Russia. And we will continue to interact with them as much as possible to, to do everything we can to prepare for this event. Have they been cooperating? Yes, ma'am. They have been very cooperative with the exception of the period of time through the Kosovo operations when we were, uh, for political reasons, stopped 
for this activity. Do, do you have any interface with the other, uh, uh, with, as they call them, the NIS, the newly emerging states? Um, you know, that would be like Georgia, and Armenia, Azerbaijan. We have not had extra activity associated with those folks. We have had a large host nation support uh, interaction ongoing. We, we cooperate and work with the State Department on that. And we have also been working with all of our NATO allies in support of their preparations for these events. And, and our, our local base commanders, wherever they reside in foreign countries, are working with those local uh, organizations to, to ensure the support or verify as much as possible how much support we will get through this period of time. That has been part of our host nation support activity. You have a tremendous task, and I uh, commend you and want you to know that we really want to help whenever we can and stay with it. Um, with regard to um, Mr. Gilligan and energy, I'm curious. This afternoon, I'm going to be going to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the swearing in of the uh, new director. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do you, Department of Energy, coordinate with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to ensure that our nuclear power plants will be ready for the year 2000. I know that it's not within your jurisdiction, NRC specifically, but your, your interconnection. The uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, as you know, has the regulatory and legal authority over the, the domestic nuclear power plants. And so they have been issuing guidance, uh, and that guidance has been implemented with, uh, within the plants. We have been monitoring those activities through two means. Uh, one, uh, we have a relationship with the North American Electric Reliability Council, NERC, which has been assigned lead domestically for electricity and to coordinate the Y2K activities. Uh, as the nuclear plants are part of our electricity generators, uh, they are being monitored through the uh, NERC reporting activities, and those activities are then reported to us. Uh, second, we have established a relationship. We actually have an ongoing relationship with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We have participation in their emergency operations facilities, and we are uh, continuing to uh, uh, track their progress, and we expect that one of the key partnerships that we will have during the rollover will be with their command center. Uh, as well, we will have Nuclear Regulatory Commission participation at our energy sector desk in the uh, Information Coordination Center. Mm -hmm. I think you also said in your uh, statement that you have found that um, you are all 100 percent compliant? For our mission critical and health and safety systems, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. How about, how about your liaison with the contractors? Would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, as you may know, the Department of Energy is structured where we have very heavy reliance on contractors. And so of our roughly 120,000 employees, uh, a little over 110,000 or about 110,000 are contractors. Um, and so we have a, a in-house, if you will, a body of contractors. And it has been those contractors that we rely on day in and day out who have done the vast majority of our Y2K remediation activities. We have brought in external independent uh, verification and validation contractors to help uh, oversee the process to ensure that we were getting objectivity, and that's worked very well. Uh, we only have isolated incidents where we have brought in new contractors for the purpose of doing uh, Y2K uh, remediation at our, at our sites. So you feel the selection of your validation crew are is adequate for total assurance that the contractors are following through? Uh, we, we believe that this was critical to our process um, because of the potential danger of a uh, contractor who does this work day in and day out potentially missing something. We uh, required the external and independent verification and validation. The, uh, we, we defined a process for conducting that. Uh, we defined a reporting process that went through line management at each of our sites for each of our mission critical and health and safety systems. And so this became a very important part of our confidence building through the line management chain that our remediation activities had uh, been done properly. And, and I'm pleased to report that we found very little uh, discrepancies or items of concern in our independent verification and validation. Mm -hmm. oh, glad to hear that. 
Um, Mr. Turner has been very kind to let me continue to ask each of you a question, then I'll turn to him. And um, Mr. Car Cosgrave, you knew, you, you knew we're coming to you with regard to what I had posed to the first panel and that uh, letter that was written to uh, Bill Archer um, on October 15th uh, that you reported that the quality of your computer systems inventory currently poses a high risk to the Y2K effort. You addressed it a little bit in your statement, your oral statement. I just wondered if you'd give us um, uh, an update on the status to complete the inventory process. I wonder um, when it will be completed. Why did it take so long? I mean, what, were there some glitches here that that if you could go back, you would have changed? Um, and uh, how would you adequately plan contingencies in the event of, uh, if given the fact that you're still determining um, the systems that you now have, how would you uh, adequately uh, plan contingencies in the event of a Y2K problem or failure? Thank you for asking the question. Uh, let me uh, try to um answer the, the questions. Let me try to hit them all. Uh, I need to first explain um, some background on this. Uh, tracking inventory um, in a um, large enterprise such as the uh, Internal Revenue Service is a, is a major problem for any large enterprise. It's, it's, it's uh, significantly uh, more difficult for us because of the highly decentralized nature of the way the Internal Revenue Service has historically operated and, and frankly because of the uh, uh, the level of uh, detail at which we are now trying to track this data. I, I don't think the second problem is different for, frankly, anybody else on the panel or, or anybody else in private industry based on my 25 years of working in private industry. Um, we, were, we were, were made more difficult by the highly decentralized nature. To give you an example, though, of how complicated this is, we have recognized this actually as a material weakness within the Internal Revenue Service dating back to 1984, so it's been recognized as a 15-year-old problem that we still haven't been able to solve. This time, for Y2K purposes, we are tracking about 800,000 items in our inventory, 800,000. Uh, and to give you an example, we would track every PC, every piece of equipment, every piece of software that is on that equipment. And for Y2K purposes, we have to track every release version of every piece of software that's on every computer. So it gets extremely uh, detailed when, you, when you're up to 800,000. Um, prior to, uh, this is a good example of where Y2K has maybe finally given us the push to solve a long-standing problem. And in fact, um, prior to um, starting our Y2K program, we were probably, in many cases at best, 50 percent accurate in our inventories. I can report to you today that based on some of our most recent tests, we've, we're now over the 90 percent uh, level. However, there still are issues. Uh, we have a three-step process in place right now. Um, to um, bring this together and make sure it's in place, not only for uh, January 1, but also for October 1, which was a critical date for establishing a uh, valuation purpose for the fiscal year for financial purposes. Um, so we're working both those problems simultaneously for the financial uh, records as well as for the um, uh, Y2K inventory. We are uh, we're addressing the problem now with three specific actions. We are doing an on-the-ground, wall-to-wall inventory in all our computing centers, uh, all our service centers, and 11 of our 33 districts. We are furthermore doing independent um, uh, verification and validation of those results uh, here at uh, the national office for all our largest computers, our Tier 1, Tier 2 computers, and uh, doing a, a detailed comparisons between what's recorded from the inventory and what, what we have actually on the floor. <coughs> and then third, <coughs> we have started an independent audit and readiness verification, which is also going out to all our computer centers, all our service centers, and again, 13 of the 33 districts, different ones this time, um, to essentially make sure that we, in fact, uh, can validate, uh, get to this as close as 100%. Um, what's different now, though, most importantly, is that the CIO and myself is now 100 percent responsible for the inventory. Uh, that was not the case uh, prior to my arrival last uh, July. Um, the inventory responsibility was a decentralized responsibility, and as a result, we were not able to adequately get our hands around this. Longer term, the solution to this problem will clearly be automatic tracking, which we're in the process of implementing, so that, in fact, we can automatically record everything that's on our network. 
Um, could, uh, I, I know the people who are listening and, and watching would like to know, could IRS computer problems result in more citizens being uh, audited? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be a concern. I, I, I think uh, uh, from, from the individual uh, person uh, looking at this testimony, I, I would think the, uh, the major concern uh, would probably be around whether they're going to get their uh, refund on time. Um, so we're taking special processes, uh, much like the ones that uh, um, Social Security described, to make sure that refund checks are processed in a timely basis. Of course, our process for sending out refunds would start towards the end of January rather than the beginning of January. So we have a little more ample time than SSA might to make sure that that's working perfectly. But we go through exactly the same processes that SSA described in working with FMS and the post office, et cetera, to make sure those checks get, get distributed. So I think that is probably the thing that your viewers would be most concerned about. Is there anything that the public should do to uh, protect themselves against possible IRS computer failure? Well, what, what the public needs to do is what the recommended, what the tax preparers will recommend they do every year, uh, and that is keep tax records at home. I mean, they, they will need tax records if, in fact, they are uh, summed in for a, uh, an examination, and therefore they need to keep good, accurate records like they would any other year. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that the bill from uh, um, IRS uh, sent to uh, Chairman Art should be included in the record. Fine. Objection. It will be so ordered. Thank you. Now for our Postal Service. At the hearing we had back in February of this year, um, Mr. Lorenz, um, you stated that the Postal Service's contingency plan um, was itself. A and you kind of implied that today, too. That is, that there is no other organization um, that can deliver mail in the event of unforeseen computer failures. And you say that mail will be delivered. I wonder who can deliver the mail in the event of unforeseen computer problems? And what are your main contingency plan risks? And what have you done then to mitigate your risks? Well, I guess an answer to the uh, first issue is, is that our own uh, computer uh, systems, uh, we have focused on the severe and critical systems um, the severe and critical systems, 33% uh, of the functionality has already been tested with the fiscal year turn. Uh, we have experienced no operational failures at all. Uh, we've had, we had 17 anomalies where the right, the wrong date was appeared on a screen or perhaps was printed on a piece of paper, but no operational uh, failures whatsoever in the system so far. And as I mentioned uh, previously, um, in our mail processing equipment. Um, we have worked that hard in many locations under full volume, um, and, and so we're very confident that, uh, that those uh, systems have been mitigated. Um, ultimate, we are the ultimate contingency, so how will the mail uh, be delivered? Uh, it wasn't too many years ago that our sortation and delivery was done manually with little uh, mechanization. Uh, A, we have not uh, forgotten those tool sets in a minimum. Um, I think our, uh, the major risk that we have that I think we've also addressed uh, in our continuity plannings is loss of uh, major uh, infrastructure uh, capabilities, power, uh, telecommunications, etc. Uh, we have detailed plans in place to mitigate that. Uh, we do that as a normal matter of course. We just did it in Florida. We just did it in North Carolina. We had to do it in L.A. Uh, we're used to working without those capabilities, and so we can do that. Uh, just like anyone else, if it was a more of a general nature failure, that would be the highest risk. And you would probably take care of that by manually Absolutely. making sure the mail is, is, is delivered. Um, I thank you. I now would like to turn to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Turner, for his turn at any questioning or statements. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. You know, I've always often wondered if when we go through January 1st, if we go through it with relatively uh, minor disruption, if we won't look back and wonder if uh, we avoided one of the 
the greatest threats to our domestic tranquility and threats to national security that we've ever experienced in this country, or whether we'll look back and think, well, we dealt with one of the most overstated, overstudied, over-discussed problems that cost us literally billions of dollars in both the public and private sector. And I thought it would be helpful in, in, in terms of trying to allow the general public to understand uh, what all of this study, all these contingency plans, uh, all these validation efforts um, have been about. If, if I could ask each of you uh, to give us an example of one specific problem that you did discover, that you did fix, and if you hadn't fixed it, what would have been the significant consequence of the failure to have discovered it and fixed it? And uh, I'll give you a little time to think about that, and I have a few other questions I want to address, and I'll leave that for my last question for each of you, because I think if we could come up with a good example from each of you, it might help the public understand what all this effort and expenditure was really all about. You know, it's all well and good to hear we're checking our systems. We validate. We know there's not going to be a problem. But I think it's also helpful to know what, what problem was really found uh, and fixed. One long-term consequence, I think, of the effort that you've made that will have lasting value is in terms of our national security. Uh, we all know that we talk a lot about uh, the threat of uh, nuclear uh, warfare, the threat of uh, chemical warfare, the threat of biological warfare, but we also know that uh, at the end of this century we also face the threat of cyber warfare. And I want to address this question to Dr. Langston because I think that it is important for us, having gone through the effort uh, to address the Y2K problem, uh, that once we hopefully successfully move through it, that we not take all of our contingency plans and throw them in the wastebasket, but recognize that they do perhaps have some long-term benefit in terms of being prepared for the threat of cyber warfare. And uh, Dr. Langston, if you would, just address the implications of what you have done in the Department of Defense, which would obviously be directly related to the issue I raised, as well as what you might see as the benefits of the efforts that have been made all across the public and private sector with regard to preparation for cyber warfare. Thank you, sir, for that question. We. Uh currently operate, as I mentioned, with year 2000 as our highest priority in the department short of uh, military operations. And we also operate with cyber threat as our second highest priority for everything that relates to the movement of information within the department. Uh, we have, in this past year, uh, stood up what we call a joint task force for computer network defense, which has now been moved under the uh, unified commander for sync space. Uh, signifying the importance of this operation. In other words, we believe that it is an operational four-star commander's uh, importance level, importance of level of importance for supporting and monitoring and preparing for computer network defense. That's an indication that our operational forces have realized that these computer networks are critical and, and an integral part of all of our warfighting operations. And they include, of course, the support operations, logistics, finance, personnel, as well as uh, direct military mission operations. Uh, so therefore, we plan to continue on through the preparation and development of cyber warfare uh, defensive measures. We, we posture and are working right now on what we call an information assurance architecture which is literally a defense in depth architecture uh, w that will allow us to specify for all of our uh, operational forces and systems how we want them to use the technologies of today and the technologies that emerge for information assurance. Uh, in addition, we have already put policy in place. I'm talking about policy signed out by Dr. Hamry, the Deputy Secretary, 
to install public key infrastructure. These are encrypted uh, certificates that allow us to understand who it, it is that is at the end of every computer transaction, both internal to our department and external to the department, and to put these in place in the next three years. And in addition, we have taken a, a step to move towards using the uh, new smart card technology, which are literally credit cards with a chip on them as a part of this security uh, network defense operation uh, to allow these smart card chips to become uh, hardware instantiations of these encrypted certificates to represent who we are. So uh, we take it all very seriously. We believe that the uh, pressure uh, that has been applied through both the executive branch and the congressional legislative branch for uh, critical infrastructure protection is vitally important to all of us, and we work very hard with uh, judicial department and state department and others to help uh, put in place these efforts and, and make them uh, a major part of what we do. It, it seems obvious to me that our technological superiority, which is caused us to be the world's greatest military force, perhaps is also our greatest vulnerability. Uh, what about my suggestion that the other agencies of government and perhaps the private sector not simply put all of their plans in the wastebasket, but remember that there is an ongoing national security threat to all of us that perhaps those plans would be useful in preparing for? Thank you for reminding me of that question. I meant to uh, suggest, uh, as we went through our what I called our chairman's contingency assessments, where we took major systems offline from our operational forces, in every one of those events, uh, the unified commanders came back and said to the chairman, uh, this was a very useful exercise. It was money and energy well spent. It allowed us to update our contingency plans, and it reminded us uh, that we need to refine and continue to exercise those plans. We, of course, in the military uh, have always had contingency plans and always had backup plans for everything we do, uh, but like any organization, it's easy to not exercise them as often as, as you might need to, given the press of uh, ongoing business. So we plan to continue to use the contingency plans as an operation, and, and in fact, uh, working with the GAO and uh, recent uh, legislation in the Appropriations Bill, we plan to follow on with our year 2000 database to support the uh, tracking of these information systems and the evolution of this entire uh, information assurance architecture that I suggested. Well, let me ask the question that I posed in, at the outset, uh, and starting with Mr. Dyer, could you cite for us one problem that was discovered and that you fixed and share with us the consequence that may have resulted had you failed to fix it. And, and I ask that, I, when we started out this effort uh, many months, years ago, we all heard there weren't enough computer programmers available to fix all these problems. Some months ago, we asked at one hearing whether or not that was still the case, and what we learned is that, no, that really wasn't a real problem. Uh, so obviously, we've been able to cope thus far with the available personnel. Uh, but I still assume that it took many man hours of computer programmers to check out these systems. And in the process, they found some things that they fixed. But if you would, Mr. Dyer, give us a good example uh, from your agency of something you found and fixed. As, as, as Madam Chairperson um, Woman said, we started back in 89, so we've had a long time to do it, and as we've been updating software over the years, we've been continuously doing it. Uh, I'll give you a, a, the, the major -ish problem would have happened if the software was not adjusted, the computers, when the software ran through the computers, would, not, would get the dates and everything confused, which would have meant that the calculations for what our beneficiaries would be paid in the month would be all wrong, and on top of that, it would probably stop the messages from going through to actually print out the checks and send the direct deposits. In terms of, of very small kinds of things, as we went through uh, telecommunication systems and looked at them, what would have happened is that certain data that we would have been transmitting over satellites to move various things around the uh, country would just not have happened. Dr. Langston, without breaching national security, uh, 
revealing anything that might be top secret, could you give us an example of something that was found and fixed and the consequence of failure to do so? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> an indication of how critical this has become for us is that many people in the early days of the year 2000 problem dismissed it as not a very significant or real problem. And as each of our folks, including our very senior uh, managers and leaders, have gotten involved with it, they have all uh, been very, uh, become very serious about the importance of it as they've discovered what kinds of examples uh, have come forward. Let me just give you a couple of examples. In our finance and accounting systems, we have literally found that we would not have been able to move uh, money between ourselves and our vendors or through the financial system and we would have not been able to make payment to our retirees uh, without fixing those systems. In our medical equipment systems we have found many examples of where we would have not been able to support uh, the medical records or even the medical processes that, that, that distributed medical activity to the medical recipients. Uh, in, in a very vivid example, our communication switches, which are commercial switches, but which uh, we, we purchase over long periods of time, often don't keep them up to date uh, with the latest changes in the commercial switch market. Uh, we found over 120 switches that would have gone down during the Y2K period of time. And but to replace that entire system with modern technology, so we literally would have, would have not been able to process tax returns. The, uh, the second example is with respect to security. We've been running um, a fairly old security environment uh, that was decentralized like many things at the IRS, and it was very clear that we needed to uh, bring that up to speed and, and up to date. And so we have made a major improvement in our security uh, environment as a result of the Y2K effort. And the third example I'll give you, and maybe this might be most dramatic. This is at one of our nuclear waste processing plants at uh, our Savannah River operations in Aiken, Georgia. We have a, a series of, of systems that are interconnected that uh, provide for uh, processing and treatment of, of nuclear waste, high level. Uh, nuclear waste products, containerizing them and shipping them. In the course of the uh, analysis and the inventorying of those systems, we found that many of the embedded processor chips that were involved with the process control of moving the uh, waste from one station to another, uh, as well as those computers that monitored the, uh, the exhaust uh, stacks for uh, possible uh, uh, increased levels of radiation had Y2K related problems. Uh, those were uh, in many cases easily fixed. In some cases they were required redesign of new special purpose uh, computers in order to be able to, uh, to fix the problems. And so, uh, and those systems then were installed and they had to be installed during downtimes of the process uh, so that they would not disrupt operations. Now, Many would fear that a possible Y2K failure would result in a nuclear accident. Uh, that is not, in fact, the case. In all of those circumstances, what would have happened, they would, uh, the process would have failed, would have triggered automatic shutdown procedures. But the automatic shutdown procedures, while they protect against any nuclear release of, it, of uh, uh, contamination, they do cost money because we would have a approximately three million dollars a year a, a day impact in cost of lost opportunity if in fact those systems had not been repaired. So that's an example where obviously there is there is high visibility because of the nuclear processing. Uh, we felt confident even though uh, these problems existed they would not have caused the health and safety uh, consequence but they would have had a, f a fairly significant financial impact if we had not repaired them prior to January 1st. Thank you. Mr. Cotgrave. Mr. Turner, if I may, I'd like to give you three quick examples, uh, all stemming, frankly, from um, somewhat the neglect in terms of allowing us to have a fairly antiquated uh, um, infrastructure that hadn't been addressed in a long time. The, fir the first example, probably the most important, is we have replaced the entire uh, submissions and remittance processing system that operates in our service centers for processing the uh, tax returns when they come in. Um, the system was, uh, in many cases, uh, 15 and 20 year old hardware that frankly we couldn't even get um, uh, 
replacement parts that were Y2K compliant to, to meet the need. So we had no choice but to replace that entire system with modern technology. So we literally would have, would have not been able to process tax returns. The, uh, the second example is with respect to security. We've been running um, a fairly old security environment uh, that was decentralized like many things at the IRS. And it was very clear that we needed to uh, bring that up to speed and, and up to date. And so we have made a major improvement in our security uh, environment as a result of the Y2K effort. And the third example I'll give you, and maybe this might be most dramatic to the to people listening in, is that when our revenue agents went out and visited taxpayers, uh, they were often embarrassed uh, because they were carrying with them either an, a PC that was a 286, 386 type vintage. And for the, if you don't follow the Intel market, those were issued back in the early 1980s. And, and, and quite honestly, that, that is not adequate given uh, what they're facing uh, when they deal with the taxpayers today who quite often have much, much more sophisticated technology. So we have replaced all those uh, PCs with modern Pentium computers and now at least are on even par with the taxpayers. Thank you. And Dr. Wrench. Um, I guess I would answer the question in two ways. First of all, the two specific examples I would give. First of all, we identified an accounts payable problem um, that if it hadn't been identified, if the process hadn't pointed it out to us, would have resulted in late or no payments at all going to some of our suppliers. Second example was our air dispatch system. Uh, and in that case, we have an automated system that literally takes the mail once it's been sorted and prepared and dispatches it to aircraft. A substantial portion of the mail is airborne now, so it would have uh, given us an inability to do that in a mechanized way. So those are two significant areas that were very constructive. Um, but the second answer to the question is the, this has caused us to put process discipline in the business where we now have business owners of these issues, not just technology owners. And so we literally have, uh, and, and we're going to leverage this in how we look at security. So security is not a chief technology officer issue. It's a business issue. Uh, to give you an, an example in a more pedestrian way, we had the best close of our financial books that we've had in recent memory because we had significant configuration management and so forth in place. So the discipline that's been caused by going through this, as well as the retirement of unneeded systems, has been a positive outcome. Thank you. I must say, the, listening to all of you, the direct and the secondary benefits of the effort seem to be very apparent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Turner. And, and kind of following up on, on the questions uh, that you asked, uh, which I thought was excellent, uh, did any of you have any trouble with 9999? Can we just very quickly, did you have oh. any trouble? No, ma'am, but I would point out that in our testing efforts, we have found as many problems in the leap year rollover period, which will occur at the end of February, as we have in the Y2K period, the rollover date. So you, you're preparing for that. I yes, think we all should. And that's why our transition period includes that. Yes. Excellent. Good. We had, um, Ms. Gilligan? we had no problems on the 9th of September. We did, in fact, though, have one system that at the beginning of our fiscal year of 1 October experienced a failure. And this was a failure of, of a sub-portion of our procurement uh, data tracking system. And it was fixed uh, within uh, about a half hour, and the transactions were rerun, and the permanent fix was done uh, within about 24 hours. Uh, but it did give us a uh, clear indication that we need to have processes in place to be able to respond. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cosgrave, you Our experiences no were very similar to the Department of Defense's experiences, and, and I would reiterate the leap year problem because we are focused very much on that as part of our testing as well. Great. Mr. Lemire. Yeah, not to my knowledge, we didn't have any 999 problems. We did have a couple of cases where we printed the wrong dates, but it didn't do anything to the internal uh, code. And, and several of you have already commented on the information se computer security problem. Not only is it, is it enormous with DOD, but obviously it's very important with all of you. And I just wondered if you are taking precautions. Now, we heard what you said that is being done, Dr. Langston. You, you talked a little bit about it, Mr. Cosgrave. I wondered if the others might want to comment. Are you taking any precautions for this day one plan in terms of um, uh, the uh, uh, information technology security? 
No, we're, we're quite concerned about security. Um, we're going to be doing extra monitoring of all our systems, and we have a special team we're putting in place to concentrate totally on all the security issues. You are. Mr. Gilligan? We have a, uh, an, an organization called the Computer Incident Advisory Capability that is co-located at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. They are our cybersecurity uh, investigation and response cell. Uh, they will be active. Uh, as will uh, their uh, points of contact at all of our sites. We have established reporting procedures. They will be part of our emergency operations uh, center contingent, uh, active through this rollover period. We've uh, put in place all of the industry uh, standard firewalls and virus protection on our case-hardened side. Um, we have given specific special instructions to the field uh, on what to look for uh, in the intervention of viruses. Um, the additional area that we're looking both as far as the day one as well as the future is the uh, more e-commerce exposure. Um, we've so far issued 150,000 digital certificates for the online stamp capability. We see potential exposure, certainly in e-commerce, along with everybody else. So we're specially monitoring those uh, aspects of the business. And we're also participating in the cyber assurance effort as part of the Y2K Council that's uh, in partnership with uh, other agencies. Great. Thank you. I, I think you've all done a great job of um, uh, sharing the experiences looking back, looking ahead, what more needs to be done of your agencies. Um, I want to announce that, do you have any other, any other questions, any other comments? It's been an excellent, um, excellent hearing. Uh, please know that all the members of the subcommittees, again, will get the full testimony. And we would like your permission to be able to submit any further questioning to you from ourselves and other members of the subcommittees. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that um, Chairman Horn's opening statement be included in the record. No objection, it will so be ordered. And the next hearing of the House Y2K Working Group is going to be held next Thursday. That's November 4th. It'll be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, room 2318 of this building. Um, and the hearing is going to be entitled, Y2K Myths and Realities, What Every American Needs to Know in the Remaining 50 Days. It's now countdown 63 today, but it will be 50 at that time. And the hearing is designated to um, be the culmination of our over three and a half years and over 100 congressional hearings on Y2K computer glitch. Um, I just want to thank the following people who have been involved in some way in putting this hearing together, the majority staff of the um, Government Reform Committee, Jay Russell George, Staff Director, Chief Counsel, Matt Ryan, Senior Policy Advisor, Bonnie Held, the uh, Communications Director, Professional Staff Member, uh, Chip uh, Allsweed, Clerk, Rob Singer, Staff Assistant, PJ Caceres, an intern, Deborah Oppenheim, an intern, Technology Subcommittee, Jeff Grove, Staff Director, Ben Wu, Professional Staff Member, Joe Sullivan, Staff Assistant, Minority Staff of Government Reform, Trey Henderson, Minority Counsel, uh, Jean Gosa, Staff Assistant of the Technology Subcommittee, Minority Staff, Michael Queer, Professional Staff Assistant, Marty Ralston, Staff Assistant, Court Reporter, um, uh, Cindy Sebo, uh, and Randy Sandifer, um, who has come on the scene here too. And so I thank all of them. I want to thank um, um, Congressman Turner for being with us for the entire hearing. I want very much to thank both of our panels. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. The uh, subcommittees um, now adjourn.
Our American Presidents series continues tonight with our complete video record of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, including our program from the Eisenhower Center in Abilene, Kansas. American Presidents, Life Portrait.